Hey guys, welcome back to Ginger Breeder Products with Andrew. Today we're going to be talking about air stones, which seems like a pretty simple topic, but I feel like there is a lot more going on and some confusion about what air stones actually are or aren't. So if you're interested in that, make sure you stay tuned. And if you guys aren't already subscribed to the channel, please do that. And if you like this video and any of the videos that I have on my channel, please give a big old fat thumbs up and let's get on into it. So the first thing we need to talk about regarding air stones is whether or not it's for an aesthetic reason or for a practical reason. I know some people enjoy the aesthetics of air rising through the backside of their tank and having that big old air wall moving up and it looks really cool in tanks. Or is it for a more practical purpose that you're trying to drive a filter like a sponge filter or under gravel filter or box filter or you just have an air stone in there because you heard it's good for the fish. Uh, and I'm gonna be more talking about that second aspect because if you just want it for the aesthetics, great, you're getting all the benefits that I'm going to be talking about afterwards. To start off with, the air bubbles that are rising through the water column are not really interacting or increasing the amount of dissolved oxygen in your tank, which is what you are ultimately wanting to achieve with an air stone or any type of water agitation or water filtration, is in making sure you have a steady and readily available amount of DO, dissolved oxygen, within the tank. And an air stone, among other things like wave makers or spray bars off of a canister filter or the crashing of the water from a hang on back filter, all do that same thing. But air stones specifically are not creating oxygen or putting oxygen to your tank as the bubbles rising through the water column. It's actually happening at the surface. And before we get into that, I want to sort of talk about qualities of water and how all of this relates to what I am talking about. So the first thing is, is that water has a certain amount of carrying capacity that it can hold into it. So for instance, a container of water that is 50 degrees and a container of water that is 80 degrees, this is in Fahrenheit, not Celsius. The 50 degree, and it would still work for Celsius, but it's just a lot warmer temperatures. And at that point, the difference isn't as great. But at say 50 degrees, the amount of oxygen that you have in your bucket of water is going to be vastly greater than the amount of oxygen that will just be naturally within that bucket of 80 degree water. And that is because at cooler temperatures, water is going to come together in a tighter formation and can be able to trap, for instance, oxygen in that case much better than it is when it's warmer because it, as it gets warmer, it starts expanding out and cannot hold as much oxygen. So if you're running a cooler tank than say like a discus tank, your discus tank is going to have naturally just a lower dissolved oxygen dissolved oxygen because it is a warmer temperature than say your cool water um, hill streams that is unheated, which is going to be naturally carrying more oxygen into anyways. The other thing that we could talk about really quickly is salinity. Salinity is also going to do the same thing. As you increase in salinity, the amount of oxygen that you are able to carry within your water is going to be decreased because that salt and other things that are in your salt water are going to be taking up that carrying space that oxygen would otherwise be uh, occupying. So that is why it is also used in saltwater tanks for an air stone because it's a very surefire way to get oxygen into your tank. So all this comes together in that everything in your tank is going to be using oxygen. At some point or another, it is going to be an oxygen consumer. Even your plants during the nighttime when they are not producing oxygen, they're going to be using oxygen and releasing CO2. So there's going to be a constant withdrawal of oxygen from your tank that can then be resupplied through the addition of an air stone. So an air stone works by not necessarily the bubble rising through the water column. You have to have a very, very fine, fine bubble, like think like a diffuser for CO2 for that to happen. Normally the bubble is rising with it, and as it is rising, it is also drawing water up with it, so you get a circulation pattern or current within your tank as that water and air are rising together. And once it gets to that surface, the water and air interface, you're going to have a greater surface area by the air bubble popping than just the water flat just by itself. So that air bubble that is popping is then all exposed to the atmosphere and air can, or rather the oxygen in the air can readily diffuse into 
the water that was in that air bubble that rose with it and popped and you will then have that water fall back into your tank and then it will then circulate and you'll have oxygen within the tank. So air stones seem like a very simple thing uh, but there is actually a lot of other stuff that is interacting with it that isn't necessarily just the bubble rising through the water and the oxygen is dissolving out of the water. It's just too short of a time period for that to have any measurable impact in your aquarium. Hey guys, sorry to interrupt this video really quickly, but I realized in editing that I sort of left out why the temperature and um, salinity matter. What the temperature and salinity is going to do, it's going to, to lower the carrying capacity that is available within the water to carry oxygen. So at a higher temperature and higher salinity, the water is going to be able to like, not be able to carry as much oxygen as, say, a lower salinity, lower temperature water would be able to. So all that is to say that in, in your situation with your tank, that is something to take into consideration if you have a, a warmer tank with a higher salinity, whether it be brackish or salt water, uh, that an airstone might be very helpful for you to have just a peace of mind as a, a last resort if a pump were to fail or something else were to happen and that you wouldn't be able to supply uh, the oxygen that you normally would through a wave maker or things like that. So let's get back into the video. Sorry for that, leaving that part out. I know that might've been a little confusing as to why I included it. So if you guys have any questions about this, feel free to leave them in the comments. If you guys are interested in other things relating to air and air stones and things like that, I have a couple videos that talk about how to set up an air pump as well as my favorite air pump that I have. So I'll leave those up in the corner for you guys to check out. Uh, and then the last thing is that air stones also can help in terms of powering your filtration. A very cheap and easy way to filter a tank is with a box filter or with a sponge filter. And you have the added benefits of both, as we talked about, creating more oxygenation in your tank because of the increased surface area with the bubble bursting, as well as providing filtration through a box filter or sponge filter. So I think air stones are great, and I hope that this video has helped you understand how air stones actually work uh, and how they are an integral part of an aquarium. Not, ne not necessary in an aquarium, but they are a great thing to have that it is a very good fail-safe if, say, your main filter, like a hang on back or canister filter were to die on you, you still have that air stone in there, and that air stone is going to be providing that surface agitation that you need to increase the surface area between the water and air to help diffuse passively more oxygen into your tank. So if you guys enjoyed this video, make sure to subscribe, like this video, and make sure to check out my other videos. So if you guys have a blessed day, I'll see you guys in the next one. See ya. How long was that?